Hey everybody, it's Goblet X, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another early access draft of Modern Horizons 3, so thank you very much to Wizards of the Coast for providing, providing me with this promotional account. Without further ado, let's get into the pack one pick one of this brand new format. Ocelot Pride is a busted mythic. It doesn't look like it because it's just a one drop, but... One mana for a 1 1 first strike lifelink is already a decent stat line, and it has an egregious ability. At the beginning of your end step, if you gained life this turn, you get a 1 1 cat, and then if you have 10 or more permanents on board, you get to duplicate every token that entered the battlefield this turn. So you get two cats every time you do this. This card is ridiculous. This format has tons of ways to modify your creatures with plus one, plus one counters, auras, and equipment to make sure that this stays relevant throughout the game. And even if it just hits your opponent like two times before they find a blocker or a removal spell for it, you've gotten a really good two or even three for one there where they spent a removal spell, they're down a card, but you still have those cats sitting around for later. So Ocelot Pride is busted and it's a great way to start off the draft. So what we got for pack one, pick two, we have Static Prison. This is decent removal in an energy deck that has enough energy to keep the card exiled forever. There's Inspired Inventor, which is pretty flexible, working in an energy deck, in a modified deck, or a wide creature kind of deck. A bunch of cards I haven't read yet quite, like um, Nyxborn Hydra thing, it just has so much text. Propagator Drone's pretty fun, right? You evolve it if you have a bunch of other creatures that are bigger than the drones. Meteoric Mace seems like a ton of mana, but the Cascade's pretty big there. Pyrosurfer seems kind of nasty, right? Might speculate towards the red direction here. Two mana for a 2-2 two -two haste. Whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, this gets battle cry until end of turn, which means that when it attacks, all of your other creatures get plus one plus zero. So if you play one of the landscapes that fetches a land, then you get to trigger landfall twice, and the rest of your board gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. You can get some huge damage in with that. That seems pretty good. I mean, it's already good for any deck with a wide board. And maybe we can just jump right into Boros Aggro here, taking a Conduit Goblin now. This enters the battlefield with two energy, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you can pay one energy to give another creature plus one plus zero and haste until end of turn. So it lets your bigger creatures come in with haste and get immediate damage going, so this card seems great. And I'd like to take it here. I also like the Area Auxiliary. This is a good way to put some counters on a couple creatures, which does work quite well onto the Ocelot Pride, making it a 2-2 later, but... Take the Conduit Goblin here, try to lock in on the Boros deck, keep some other people out of it. Well, this land, or this land, this pack is just a bunch of great lands, a bunch of great mana, so we'll grab uh, the red-white landscape to go with our Pyro Surfer and fix our mana. Deep Analysis is a really good card draw. To draw four off of it total, but you do have to flash it back to get there. Emissary of Soulfire seems pretty good, too. Get a few... Energy, you guaranteed get at least one exalted creature on the board, which means whenever you attack alone, you give a creature plus one plus one until end of turn. Doesn't matter if it's the creature with exalted attacking or a different creature you control, just as long as you're only attacking with one creature, that creature's going to get plus one plus one. So it's pretty cool, pretty flexible ability. Ooh, this Ravager seems great for an Eldrazi deck. You can sack two Eldrazi spawn to bring this back from Grave to Hand. Pretty cool. Again, I think the landscape is the safest and most flexible pick there, so I'll grab it. I can do another landscape here, and that's perfectly fine with me. This auxiliary has been a pretty impressive card, though, so I do want to take some of these. I don't know if I'm going to take it over landscape this early, because this can also be Rakdos mana fixing. Like, any three of these colors being in our deck means that this fixing is great. And it is really good with Pyrosurfer, which is pretty fun, so... Pick six, there's Dog Umbra. I think this is a great removal spell from white because it's instant speed and it's really flexible. You shut off the creature's ability to attack and block, but you can also use this on your own card to give it Umbra armor, which means that if your card's going to die, instead you just discard the Dog Umbra to save it. So very cool, flexible removal. Pick seven. All right, white looks like a great place to be because we still have an Inspired Inventor, an Auxiliary, and a Static Prism. I think all of those look good here. I like that the Inventor curves out with the Ocelot Pride a little bit quicker. 
get the plus one plus one counter on it a little earlier for better attacks. But the auxiliary is definitely higher impact because flyers are also pretty much always solid. Static prison's good too, and red white is an energy kind of archetype. I might go for the interaction here, grab the static prison. Now we've got a Hex Gold Slith for a very solid energy 2-drop. Keeps buffing itself up when you hit your opponent. A couple energy... You have to spend energy to attach it. Later. It's only one mana. This one's weird. I don't know how I feel about this one. I'm just going to take the Slith, because I know that I like the Hex Gold Slith. Um, Thraben Charm's been solid, flexible removal. Obviously it can't kill the really big Eldrazi particularly easily, but its main deckable enchantment removal for opponents that are running cards like Dog Umbra and Static Prison, and its main deckable graveyard hate against anybody trying to play Reanimator. So I like it. The Rose Caught Knight has been pretty nice as well. There's a lot of artifact creatures and a lot of enchantment-based removal kind of stuff. There's even some enchantment creatures, so a lot of good options there. Grab another Static Prison, or we can grab the Inventor this time. I feel like Static Prison is the kind of card that's going to get worse the more copies we have, because they're more likely to get sacked when we're draining energy off of all of them. I'm going to grab the Inventor. I don't know, I'm also not that confident that Static Prison is super great. It just looks pretty good to me. I've only ran against it like once, I still haven't played it yet, so we'll see. All right, well, I was going to say red didn't look super open. We took all of our red cards really early, but that doesn't matter if we open up two red mythics. So we get the Boros God from Theros. Very cool card. Three mana for three to any target, and you gain three. And then this sacrifices itself, but then if you exile five other cards from your grave, you can escape it as a 6-6 six, six that does another three damage to any target, gains you three life, and does that every time it attacks super cool super strong card what is ashling four mana four four you don't lose your extra red mana and whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery discard a card then draw a card if you do it twice in one turn you do two to an opponent and all their creatures if you do it three times you get four really cool pretty explosive card but it's a lot more narrow you have to put in a lot more work for it than you do for the flage because for flage it's like just up front, 3 mana sorcery, deal 3 to any target gain, 3 is already good. And you're naturally going to end up with a bunch of cards in the grave later in the game, so this is just so much easier to work towards. You don't really have to do anything specifically great, so definitely take the flage there. Now, probably fanged flames for really efficient removal, 2 mana for 4 damage and you exile what you're hitting. That seems great. I like the Skyclaw a good amount. It's going to attack as a 4-3 flyer all by itself, but if you need that energy for other stuff, then you've got it. And the Zealot's also pretty good. These little energy cards look good for Boros, because you've got a lot of energy cards in the color pair. A lot of other ways to use that. Also Glimpse the Impossible for a little bit of late game card draw, but gotta take that efficient removal when it's available. Uh, here's another Boros landscape. I think I'll take that over Thraben Charm, because this... Um, this can be an issue when you just don't have creatures on board, so I think it's a little weaker removal than, like, the Fanged Flames here. There's not too much else. Conjurer, with really strong Enter the Battlefield effects, can do some wild stuff, but gotta wait till you have five mana. Doesn't seem great for more aggressive archetypes like Boros. Alright, pick four. Uh, one mana, one one flyer, we get to move the equipment around later, seems fine. Mandibular Kite. The Skyclaw also seems fine. What is this? It's a 3-3, three, three, and you can sack a creature when you play it to Active Treason, gain control of an opposing card for the turn. Doesn't seem like a Boros thing. I mean, it seems fine in Boros, but really seems like a like Rakdos sack kind of thing. You want to have other sack outlets so you can sack whatever you steal from your opponent. Um... I feel like curving out real quick with this kite, but I think the energy production from the dragon's pretty cool here. I'm gonna go for the dragon over the kite. Pick five, another Boros duel. We'll take it. We've got that Pyro Surfer for those Boros fetches to do a lot of work for us. 
feels better than the six mana mace, but maybe Cascade is just strong enough that six mana do nothing is still worth it when you Cascade alongside it. Because you do do stuff the turn after you play the mace. There's seven or more cards in the grave, gets plus three, plus three. So that's super huge late game, but probably not going that late game in Boros. And it works really poorly with our Titan. If we draw these two together, we're going to be really sad. So I think I'm going to take another Boros land. We're just pyro surfing all over the place. Another auxiliary would be good here, but we have two four drop creatures already. All right, pack two, pick seven. Get an energy every time we attack. For three energy, we get a 3-3. Three, three. Probably reasonable in Boros. This is so expensive, but it's cool. I like Decree of Justice. Wraths are good, but they're way better in controlling decks. There's another Boros duel, but... I don't know if I want too many more than, like, five, because I just don't want to end up with that many tap lands, you know? We'll try out the Ironworks. It's been relatively impressive for all of our opponents so far. These all look fine. Let's go full energy here. We'll try the axe thing out, maybe. Now with the Thraben Charm thing. And we just want to take a bunch of good creatures out of the next pack. Good energy creatures, ideally. We're on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 7 more creatures, and then call it a deck, pretty much. All right, pack three, pick one. What is the best card for us here? We've got so much removal, even if it is maybe a little weaker than Static Prison. I don't think I need to take the Prison that highly. I'm really looking to up the creature count right now, so we take the kind of mediocre Gatekeeper thing. It's a little extra damage in as we're playing creatures. Seems fine. Yeah, we'll take the Gatekeeper here. Pack 3, pick 2. There's another Conduit Goblin. That looks pretty excellent. Two drop creatures. They're pretty high picks. Do I take it over Galvanic Discharge? I think with our lower creature count right now, I will. Come on in, Conduit Goblin. The Conduit Goblin into Ironworks curve is really nice, too. Play the Goblin, get two energy. Play the Ironworks attack, get the third, and use it to get the Golem immediately. You know, I guess this axe is actually just, like, really good on the Ocelot Pride, because it's instant speed, auto-equip. So we just, like, delete up to three toughness worth of blockers if they try to block the Ocelot Pride. That's actually a really big deal. Speaking of big deals, let's get another Auxiliary. The Witch Enchanter's fine. Being able to cut, like, a planes for this is nice, but... Really like the supportability on the Auxiliary. To really get that board going. I mean, I guess we could take the Witch Enchanter and probably wheel one of these. Maybe. I don't know. I'm going to go for big board. Get that auxiliary here. Get the power and toughness. Pick four. Mandibular Kite. Lower the curve a little bit. Get real aggressive with a one drop. That seems like the best on-colored card, except for maybe the rose caught Knight, but the Knight is pretty slow. I'll take the Kite. Pick 5, we found another Dog Umber to get things out of the way. I like that a lot. Cut a Thraben Charm for that. Pick 6, no creatures here. Grab a Bloodstained Mire just to trigger the Pyro Surfer more. Immediately get an untapped Mountain off of it. Sure. Put an angel, demon, or dragon from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Angels, demons, dragons. We have one dragon. Sorry, Kalia. I'd love to splash you in. That would be so funny, but rose caught knight it is. We get another auxiliary, which I'm perfectly happy with. 
We're on 30 cards and 6 lands, so we're on 24 non-lands right now, which is probably where we want to be. 16 land deck. And I'll probably cut a charm for a 17th land. That seems fine. This is 23 non-lands. 17 lands here. There's another static prison. Yeah, I still really don't know how I feel about these. I'll try out the double prison. Oh, we got the Witch Enchanter back anyway. Alright, I'll play the Witch Enchanter over the 17th uh, land. I don't know if I'm playing four auxiliaries. Or double Rose Cop Knight. Okay, so let's play 16 lands and a Witch Enchanter. Still leaves us one or two more cuts again. 16 lands, Witch Enchanter, we get one more cut out of the deck. Um, we have a Phyrexian Ironworks as another creature and a Mandibular Kite as another creature. So the creature count's too higher than it looks like, but that's still just 17 for a really aggressive deck. I think we can cut a non-land here. And I'll just cut one of the Raven Charms and call it a deck there. You know, I think for curve purposes, I'm actually going to put another Rose Cotton Knight in here. I think these are pretty consistent in here. I can double check. But we've got a few artifacts. Four artifacts, four enchantments. There's eight cards they could hit out of the top six. That's not bad at all. Yeah, I'll drop one of the three auxiliaries, or I could drop like the gatekeeper. Pretty filler. We're not really a token deck or anything. Just a two, three body. I don't know. The unearth still feels pretty solid on that thing. Yeah, I'm still gonna cut an auxiliary. But that is gonna be the final build of the deck. All right, here's a look at our final deck list for today. We're on a Boros Energy Aggro build. We've got a pretty aggressive curve of creatures and some relatively explosive things we can do with energy. So we can just haste out all of our bigger creatures with cards like Conduit Goblin. We can get some counters onto bigger flyers with Thriving Skyclaw. And we can try to just spit out an army of golems with Phyrexian Ironworks. So those are our big energy payoffs, but... Other than that, a pretty solid, pretty aggressive curve. We've got the excellent Flage Titan of Fire's Fury as a huge bomb rare in the deck, and we've got tons of efficient removal to try to keep the path clear between Dog Umbras, Fanged Flames, Thraben Charm, and Static Prison. Super solid looking deck, and I am just ready to hop right into the gameplay, so without further ado, let's get in there and see how it does. All right, well, this looks like a super fine opener to me. Conduit Goblin into Inspired Inventor to haste things out and just get damage in. But we've also got that Titan of Fire's Fury, both as an early removal spell and a late game finisher once we have enough cards in our grave to reanimate it. Alright, opponent on the play starts with Perilous Landscape, tutoring out a basic island it is gonna be oh we've got an ironworks now so i could just go goblin into ironworks here to get that locked in three three i feel like that's pretty reasonable and then inspired inventor can come down and make another three three the turn after that And there's the Void Craw, so they can block the Conduit Goblin here to stop the damage. But I think it is still worth doing this instead of, like, killing the Void Craw, because it's not like the Goblin's going to die. So, Teamer Eldrazi, it looks like, from opponent. There's the Wumpus Aberration for the 6-6. Six, six. We just Dog Umber that, and it does not do anything. So we can Dog Umber that and still have Inventor's Axe up, which is going to let us kill the Void Craw when they block the Conduit Goblin. And that also lets us make 
a golem post combat. Thanks to the extra energy. Just an incredible turn there. There's Sage of the Unknowable. Solid blocker for one of our 3-3s. Three I do not have the mana to double spell alongside Fanged Flames. I'm kind of cool just sending the whole board in. Yeah, I'll just send the whole board and decide what we want to do post-combat. And I guess I could, like, haste out an inventor there and post-combat a golem still. Would have been solid. But let's just keep them off the mana here and flage, save the fanged flames. There's the concession from our opponent. We start things off 1-0 and oh, heading into game 2. All right, here we are for game number two. This is a little weird, but I think we're supposed to start with Ocelot Pride and have Dog Umbra up turn two. No, not the one mana burn. Don't do it to us. That would be disappointing. Because that's going to make our turn two real bad, because we can't crack the landscape the turn we play it to play this uh, Conduit Goblin, so I just don't cast anything next turn. Alright, they do have the burn. They were really heavily debating not doing it for some reason, but who knows. Party Thresher. On creature spells they cast from exile have Convoke. At the beginning of their pre-combat main phase, they can discard a card to exile two, and you can play one of them this turn. So they can discard a card to draw a card every turn. Basically, yeah, that's fine. It's a good ability as well, so we don't dog Umbra. Luckily, perfect top deck. We hit the natural mountain there. So we're not even punished for the turn one Ocelot Pride. I'm still sad. The first time I've cast it, my opponent has just had the instant removal for it anyway. I have never had the turn one removal for the Pride. As far as I remember. I've had the turn one removal in my deck. But didn't draw it in the game when my opponent had the Pride. Soul Trader's real good. A life, sack another creature, get a treasure. Really good against Dog Umbra as well because it has a solid ability we can't deal with here. Uh, I could Inventor's Axe and Dog Umbra in the same turn, but the Goblin still just trades for the Soul Trader if I put the Axe on it. I guess I can Dog Umbra and then Axe if they go for blocks here. And this is fine. I mean, they get to keep the Soul Trader ability, obviously, which is an ideal, but it's negative seven days into the format. So, like, nobody's going to know about the axe to play around it. At least not a lot of people will. They might just play around, like, two damage burn just in case, because you never know, but... They did not play around the axe, so they get to sack the Thrasher for a treasure here. Since it's going to die anyway without doing anything, might as well get the treasure out of it. So still not the craziest Inventor's Axe. This one was a little weaker than it was last game, but it was still solid value there. Glimpse the Impossible. Exile 3, get 3 Eldrazi spawn at worst. Kozal X command. How long are these exiled? Just this turn. Okay, so they're going to get 2 Eldrazi spawn right now. Which is great with Soul Trader, actually. They're just full-on treasure tokens. Cool. So we just play a Zealot. Because I'm not playing a Witch Enchanter without an Artifact or Enchantment to blow up. Go ahead and crack this landscape for a second red source in case I top deck like the uh, the dragon or something. Gross. Another Marauder. That's actually really gross, because they can just sack the Soul Trader on this one. They're not going to, though. They really like that ability. Fair enough. Fledgling Dragon. I need to find a way to kill that, or that's going to kill me real quick.
All right, well, Knight can dig for removal. We got some enchantment removal. There it is, Dog Umbra. And this only attacks and blocks. Yeah, it doesn't have any abilities that matter if it can't attack or block anyway. Green source from our opponent. Oh, there's Phyrexian Tower in the set, too. That's really cool. Uh, sure, I'll get into a top deck war with you. Now the game is 100% decided upon who draws the best when I draw the first card of the top deck war. But they have no cards in hand. They're playing off the top. We have Witch Enchanter playing off the top. So I am slightly favored. I will take those odds. Let's see how we all draw. I also get to thin a little more lands out of my deck than they do, since I have another landscape. Oh, not enough lands to thin out, apparently. I probably should have played this in case we tr top deck like a three drop and we need to play both of these in one turn. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ironworks is pretty good here. That's two 3-3s three we just drew into. Um, I will... Well, I guess no. If I top deck a 3-drop, I just play the land and play them both. No, we're good. We're good to sandbag a land just in case there's some kind of discard one in this format. I don't think I equipped the axe for any energy when I can just spend that energy to make more golems pretty soon. Super good board is super good. Wow. Well, we were pretty favored in the top deck war, but so far it looks like we just absolutely luck sack demolished this top deck war at this rate. Oops, <laughs> I clicked too quickly. I did not mean to take the action. I was just trying to click towards damage. That's going to be important to pay attention to in the future. That's a bummer. That actually could lose us the game if they top deck really well from here. If they hit a bomb or something, because we would have had four three power creatures. Yeah, that would have made it so they were dead on board, even if they had that. Oh my god, yeah, we're going to lose because I was just... Ah, I hate arena sometimes. Playing digital magic, just clicking the exact same button that moves to damage also spends all your energy for first strike when it doesn't do anything. It is frustrating sometimes. Oh my god, I have no mountains left. Nice. Okay, so they would have been at two life off of a swing here, but now we do still trade into one of those. We lose one creature for nothing. Oh no, the Precursor's really gross with their Soul Trader. They can just have a bunch of Eldrazi spawn to chump block with. Gross, well, you got me, I guess. We can't really do anything now, then. Like, we don't even really attack in. I guess they still take one every time they make a spawn. But I'm going to lose a creature without even killing any of their stuff. They just make a spawn and a treasure off of sacking this dragon. Trump with a spawn. And they'd have to sack two to get both spawns. I'm going to send in the team. It gives us the third energy to get another 3-3 here. I just need to not click the move to damage button because that secretly turns into the spend two energy button. Decline! Alright, now it's a next button. Yep.
Yeah, we would have them down to four here. And then I'd have three three threes left over after this. Seven. Two blockers. Block, block. Witch Enchanter. Be three, four, five. I think I need to go wide. Try to speed this up because this card can really win a top deck where every land they play can turn into another creature. Which makes them like two or three times as likely to draw creatures. Because like even off fetch lands, then it's really, really likely. Yeah. Man. I think we might just if we do lose, I think we probably just lost because the digital magic misclick thing. Where obviously I was just intending to move to damage, but it ended up spending two energy for literal nothing. That would be very disappointing, and so far it is looking that way. They are really set to stabilize from here. If we don't find one of our really good spells now, like Flage or something. They're going to go big aggro here, sack the spawn to borrow a 3-3. They can sack it to the Phyrexian Tower, which is disgusting. I guess they don't even have to go big aggro here, they can just sack one of our creatures without attacking with anybody else. Yeah, no, Infernal Captor is actually huge when you have Phyrexian Tower on board. Yeah, that's ridiculous, that's... A creature and they just immediately kill our best creature too. So it's a two creature swing in the board state. In these lands out of here. There it is. That is the card I was talking about. One of our best draws that could flip the game. We can put them to one and then they have to find a way to kill this or they die to it. But I think they would have just straight up been dead right now. They would have been straight up dead right now if I didn't misclick. So, F's in the chat on that one. That's my bad. I don't know how to operate digital programs. All right, they have one top deck to deal with Flage. And even if they deal with it, if it doesn't get exiled, we can just escape it again and win. Yeah, this card is filthy. Get bailed out by a Mega Bomb Mythic? It looks that way. Oop. Play it safe so I don't randomly die. Get bailed out from our misclick. By a Mega Bomb Mythic. And we are now 2-0 heading into game 3. Hmm. This is a little awkward mana, but technically it's the right mana to play whatever we want. And it has the best card in the deck. So I'm going to keep it here. We're against Headology, a fellow streamer. She's got some pretty good streams. She does just a ton of draft, pretty much. Exclusively. And she is on Gruel. Alright, we need a red source. And we're just going to start pyro surfing, right? Paste on in. Well, is it actually more damage to go Conduit Goblin into the Pyro Surfer with a double battle cry trigger next turn? It is certainly more damage the other way around. Unless... Actually, no, I guess it's like the same amount, right? Well, no, because the goblin would be summoning sick next turn if I wait. It's probably more damage, I don't know. 
Math is for blockers. Woo! Party time! Get the double red, so we have double red, double white for Flage. In the late game. Could spend an energy for an extra damage, but it already has haste, so I'm just going to keep the energy. Battle cry, battle cry, six damage. Show me the flash blocker. Nope. Just going to cycle a bountiful landscape. Wumpus Aberration. Get a 6-6 six, six blocker, and we do not have any of our removal to clear that out of the way this game. Which is quite bad. Well, I can make sure these are both 3 power here, I guess, and then trade up into it. A little bit of a 2 for 1 here, but getting it out of the way might be worth it. Oh, I wish I had one more mana I could play another creature and then, like, really go in here. Uh, I'm just gonna take a turn off. It's probably fine. I guess I could just let one of these die, actually, to cash in a ton of damage. No, that is so worth it, actually, now that I think of it. Just sacrifice one of these to deal a ton. Yeah, I've turned one of these into two mana, deal four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Yeah, that's so worth it. This is so much better than not attacking. 11 it is, and now she is dead to Flage. Chrysalis for a ton of blockers, but only a colorless mana up. I guess three colorless. I do not think that the Kozilex charm thing counters, so I think we're good. Here's Flage. Three damage to the face. And there's the concession. We are now three and oh. Turns out Boros aggro is just good in every format ever made. And we are undefeated heading into game four. All right, here we are for game four. We're three and oh right now. This is a the Relander, thanks to the Witch Enchanter. Kind of slow, though. Our cheapest creature is four mana, but we're on the draw. Could draw into cheap stuff. I don't really think we mulligan three landers. We've got all of our colors set up as well. We can just be mildly disappointed by the speed of the hand. But I don't think we can mulligan it. We grab a white mana off of this. We're gonna need to get a red mana out of one of these to play the Sky Claw later, eventually. All right, top deck to the white source. That was the wrong land to play. I should have played the landscape, get one of the tap lands out of the way here. Witness, even if I dog Umbra that, it can still return a permanent from their grave to hand, so that is not a great dog Umbra target. Well, looks like it doesn't really matter what lands we chose to play, because we are not going to have a 2 or 3 drop to cast now regardless. Let's get the landscape out of here. We only have the one landfall card in the deck, so let's just thin another basic out of here to make it less likely to draw more. Now we know the Witch Enchanter is definitely getting cast instead of played as a land. So we're going to go Skyclaw into Rosecott Knight. And it'll be a nice slow game, which is a problem because Teemer is one of the best slower archetypes that I've seen so far because Teemer has all of the gigantic Eldrazi 
to ramp into. So I don't love how things have gone so far. If we were against another aggressive deck, I'd actually be pretty happy with the hand because then we just dog umber their first aggro play and try to play bigger cards than them. But we're not really going to play bigger cards than Teamer. So they can definitely get ahead in a long game here. Okay, another Perilous Landscape. Let's cast our first spell, which will probably just get killed by some kind of instant. I don't imagine they had nothing to do with their four mana at sorcery speed, so they're probably holding up some kind of instant speed burn or something. Oh, an instant speed cycler. Fair enough. That gives them the Eldrazi spawn to ramp up. So they are closer to an explosive Eldrazi, and their one mana removal spell kills our four mana creature. That is always devastating. Especially when they had something to spend the rest of the mana on, so they're just super mana efficient there. They have six mana available now. There's it that heralds the end. They get to buff up the Eldrazi token, and the witness gets to put the big... 7-7 seven, seven back in their hand, and now they can drop it as an 8-8 eight, eight on us. We can dog under that, but die to everybody else here. It's a Thraben Charm, which is pretty mediocre right now. Just play the Knights. Next turn, we can play Auxiliary or Enchanter and a removal spell alongside it. Get the Inventor's Axe. That is the mana to play the Lurker. Or a Breaker of Creation, which is Hexproof from Colored Spells and Annihilator 2, meaning the game is completely over. Because all I can do is trump block that. It's Hexproof from each color, so even colored abilities, I can't even target it with a Static Prism. So I just chump block it and sacrifice two additional permanents every turn. Yeah. That's got me. What is this, 11 damage on board? I guess we're not dead yet. We'll let them uh, We'll let them get the kill here, but uh, we've got nothing. Just play an auxiliary. Oh. Yes. I mean, they're at 27, but I was going to say I guess we can try a tiny bit to outrace here. That's the only hope because I don't even have a supply of chump blockers for the Breaker of Creation, let alone the extra permanence for the Annihilator triggers. And they just got removal anyway. Cool. Well, probably better to... sacrifice the axe than a land. Oops, I clicked too quickly, and I don't get to sack the axe anyway. Oh, there's that busted thing again. Five mana, seven, five, draw extra cards every time they landfall. And this is super dead. Dog number that and take eight. All right. GG. Three and one. We just had our dirtiest, slowest hand there. I think the only thing we really could have done was maybe mulligan. Our most aggressive hands can probably win that matchup, but they had a very solid deck and they curved in some large Eldrazi early, so it would have had to been a really good hand to beat that, and our opener was certainly not up to snuff. We are now 3-1, and one, heading into Game 5. And for Game 5, we've drawn the worst hand so far, four white spells and just two red sources. That is a forced mulligan there. Okay, this has both of our colors thanks to the Shattered Landscape. 
Probably need to crack the landscape turn one to guarantee I can cast red spells turn two, because there's a lot of red spells here. We go... That means we don't play the kite turn one, because we're playing landscape turn one. So I probably ditch the kite then, right? We go landscape for red source. I mean, I guess we're on the draw. So if I keep the kite in hand, that makes it so if I, like, top deck a mountain, I can go kite into Conduit Goblin or Pyro Surfer. Yeah, I can get rid of Dog Umbra because it doesn't stop abilities, and we still have one removal spell to clear a path. This might be wrong, but that's what I'm going to do here. Alright, we did not top deck the mountain, so we're just going to grab it off of the landscape. And we should have just got rid of a Mandibular Kite. This was the draw. Faithful Watchdog is the play. Just exile that thing. Probably will. 3-3 three, three is pretty sturdy. Well, there's the mountain. Turn too late. If nothing else, now I get to play Kite and Pyrosopher on the same turn next turn. I can also play Kites, haste it off of the Goblin, and play Flames next turn, which is exciting. You know... I think I'm gonna go for it. See if we go kite and flames next turn with a hasty mandibular kite. No protection spell, please. Three mana up, they didn't play any creatures. Alright, no protection spell. Good enough for me. Go team, go! Is it gonna be the uh, cycler? No, no cycler either. Just cracking a landscape. Nyxborn Unicorn. Now we get to play no auto tapper. We get to play Pyro Surfer and Hex Gold Slith Haste the Slith thanks to the Conduit Goblin's ability and Battle Cry the whole board. This is gonna be a massive swing. As long as we keep Auto Tapper out of this. Met up. They are going to wither the Pyro Surfer away. Still lets me get a Slith first strike attack in. To get the counter onto it. But then I don't have the energy left to give the Rose Caught Knight haste. But if I don't top deck a land for the Rose Caught Knight, I don't really want to give it haste anyway. Because I'm not playing it. I would still want to give it haste a couple turns from now though. I mean, I guess if they trade into Goblin, even if I don't give this first strike, then I can't give the Knight haste regardless. Mm, I'm going to keep the haste ability available. If they trade into Slith and they do trade into Slith. I feel like that's just like a lot of damage to be able to play the rest of our creatures throughout this game with haste. And there we go. Beautiful. Unless they have instant speed removal for Goblin, then they kill it before we move to the beginning of combat step. Hmm. No blockers on board. Do we take the pacifism or do we just take another threat? And on Earth as well? I kind of want to take the pacifism. Though, because it's just a 2-3. Two cards in their hand, and breathe your last for removal on the 4-4 is the play. They take three and go to 11. The 
We've got one card left, and if it is a blocker, we've got that dog, Umbra. We got that dog in us. All right, they're down to five. And we've got the way to clear a blocker out. And there's the concession that is now four and one as we head into game six. All right, here we are for game number six. We're four and one right now. Our first creature is until turn three, but we got plenty of mana. Solid interaction. I'm going to keep, but this could be our second loss just from having a, a slower, dirtier hand. I swear I can say the word dirtily. Alright, just a couple swamps for now. Here is our first planes. If I could click on it. Oh my god, Arena. There we go. <laughs> like, good grief, just let me play the game. Grab another white source. Mono black still. There's the etched slith. I pacify it, it doesn't do anything anymore. Because all it has is a combat damage ability. True. Sure, that's mana efficient. Uh, I guess I have the witch enchanter to kill it. Eh, maybe. To hold on to the witch enchanter would be solid there. There's the Gatekeeper as the first creature that we play, so every other creature we play is also doing some damage. Oh, good, they're an Artifact deck. That means Witch Enchanter is still gonna be great. Witch Enchanter? Disenchanter. Goodbye, Condor. They can move all the counters over to the Slith if they find a way to deal with the Dog Umbra. But, uh... They probably don't have a lot, because the most artifact-heavy color pair in the format is black-red, which I think just doesn't have a way to deal with uh, enchantments. So yeah, they're just going to sack it, draw two. They're black-white, so they could have had their own witch enchanter, maybe. There's an inspired inventor, just get a 3-3 here, probably. Or a 2-2 and a 1-1 either is going to be good enough on blocks here. So, we play a Rose-Caught Knight. I think I just play a Rose-Caught Knight here, and just send in the team. Trading into a 2-2 two -two is A-OK, -okay, especially when we have the Unearth ability. Get another Dog Umbra. We got that dog in us. Sure thing. Let's cash in a couple damage and get rid of the 2-2. Two -two. Unfortunately, our Theros God is somewhere in the bottom five now. Ooh, Ocelot Pride? I don't think I have another way to gain life, though, so it's really unlikely to trigger this late. Um, Dog Umber the Enforcer. I still have three mana left. Which is enough to play a conduit goblin i guess no i have too many colorless sources i need to start cracking these landscapes yeah if i dog umbra or static prison i don't get to play anything else this turn so i just play a single rose caught knight and then i'm still stuck on red and white mana or just play a single Dog Umbra and then fix my mana issue. I'm going to fix my mana issue here. I'm just going to deal with this mana situation. We're turning all these landscapes into red and white sources. Really thinning the deck out here at the same time. So I can actually cast multiple spells next turn. All of these are white spells, so we're probably grabbing two white sources and one red. One red so we could unearth Gatekeeper and play Goblin in the same turn if we want. And for any double red cards we draw into. 
but we definitely prioritize the white. pretty good they get the condor back and kill our three four it's a sick two for one actually return another permanent you control on all auras you control attached to it to their owner's hand so they can bounce the enforcer to replay it later that is such a narrow card to get just really got by here but they got us we got got Oh, they could just die to Conduit Goblin Haste shenanigans here, especially with the Unearth as well. If they hold zero blockers up at nine life, this could be big for us. Let's find out. Probably not lethal, but big. Okay, I can have both of the Conduit Goblins haste each other out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One damage off. If I got triple red, I would have killed them here. Uh, well, Gatekeeper is four damage. And I have three mana up. I can Conduit Goblin. It's five. Oslet Pride, six. Haste of the Pride, 7, 8. I just have multiple ways to deal 8. I think we probably deal 8 without the Gatekeeper then to make it really likely to lethal them next turn. That feels like the play. And then we use the Gatekeeper to try to lock in the lethal on a future turn. I guess it's probably better to hit them with the Pride here, put them to 2 instead of 1, but still leave the Gatekeeper for a future swing oh wait no that would have been exact lethal wait one two three four five six seven eight how would that have been lethal where did i mess up the math oh no i didn't they, they would have been at one they would have been at one it wouldn't have been lethal I just saw two life and a two power creature not attacking. I was like, that would have just been lethal if that sent in as well. It's like, no, because then we wouldn't have done the two from the pride. So they'd been at four taking three. All right. They need instant speed removal to deal with this gatekeeper to not die to just an enter the battlefield effect. And even if they have that, we can send the entire team in and somebody gets in for one damage. Or somebody gets in for, uh, for two damage. Sorry. Yeah, there is the concession. And we are now five and one. And I think that is good enough for me here. These streamer events are limited time events. These are only up for like 12 hours. So I'm trying to jam in as many drafts as possible, see as many different decks as possible throughout the event. It is a little embarrassing. This is our first draft. We actually made it to five wins, but I am going to uh, go ahead and retire the decks at uh, at five wins. If you've been watching any of Numat's videos, he does uh, very similar Cut these events, uh, cut these drafts a little early so that we can get into more, get some more videos recorded for you all in the short amount of time that us content creators have time to draft in this streamer event. So we're going to cut it there. Five and one, good enough for me. I think this deck could definitely made it to seven wins, probably seven, two on average. But even if I scrubbed out the next two games and got five and three, I think that was solid. I think Boros is just the strongest and simplest archetype that we've seen so far, but it is often the strongest archetype in the first week or two of the format, just because it's always pretty simple to build. A lot of the other archetypes, you might want to have more experience with the format and really know what you want to take when you want to take it. But these Boros decks have been constantly demolishing me. And now that we've played it ourselves, it was our best deck by far win rate wise. It was the simplest. We made the best lines because they were pretty easy lines to make. And uh, yeah, definitely an archetype that I recommend for almost any format if you're newer to the format 
play Boros, get really aggressive, curve out on your opponent, and try to kill them before all of their fun, crazy stuff resolves. It's pretty consistent and pretty viable. Obviously, the best card in the deck was the Titan of Fire's Fury. That was incredible here. But even without that, just the commons and uncommons curving out pretty aggressively. The Ironworks was a huge overperformer as well. We got to do some wild, wild stuff. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this and you're interested in seeing some more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon for some more. Magic Arena.